Okay, so we're talking today about gravity. We've been talking uh, about Newton's forces, Newton's laws, um, and we're continuing that conversation, uh, following through basically his physics and what he discovered and described. Uh, gravity is one of his earlier discoveries, um, and we're, we're studying that this week. So gravity, there's the famous story of him sitting under an apple tree, and an apple fell off, and, and it hit him, and he thought, why did the apple go down instead of up? And that made him, you know, ask the question of gravity. Whether or not that actually ever occurred, it, it might be just, you know, kind of a, a legend. But maybe it happened. The, the answer to the question, why did the apple go down instead of up, is because of gravity. Now, gravity is an attraction between two objects. So right now, I am exerting a gravitational force on this body. And, and my body, the mass of my body, is attracting the mass of this bottle. When I let go of the bottle, then I'm no longer holding it up. And we're going to see which gravity is strong. The gravity that the Earth is pulling on for the bottle, or the gravity that my body is pulling on the bottle. The Earth wins. The attraction between the bottle and the Earth was greater than the attraction between my body and the bottle, because gravitational forces are proportional to the masses of the objects. So, praise the Lord, I'm a lot less massive than the planet, right? If I were as massive as the planet, then I would attract the bottle as much as the planet did. But I'm not. Hallelujah. Um, so the, the sum of the masses, the mass of object one times the mass of the second object, object two, uh, and, uh, plays a role in how much those two objects are attracted to each other. So the more massive they are, the more that they are attracted to each other, which is why really big, huge planet Earth, and many, 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 many times larger sun are attracted to each other across huge distances of space because their masses are so massive. Um, the distance between them also plays a role. The distance between them weakens the force. So the bigger they are, the more they're attracted to each other. The further apart they are, the less attracted they are to each other. So you are attracted to the sun as well, but thankfully your mass is not enough to have the sun pull on you so hard that you go flying off the planet and burn up in the sun. Praise the Lord, that's the truth. So you are attracted by the much closer mass of the planet. So you stick to the planet. Out in space, you, you would be floating around in space in some little spacesuit. You'd be attracted by the mass of the planet and the mass of the sun, and depending which one you were closer to, would control which one had a stronger gravitational pull on you. So mass and distance controls how much objects attract each other by a gravitational force. Okay? Um, we have a, a number for how hard is the acceleration of gravity. Gravity accelerates all objects towards the center of the Earth with a with an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared. So when you are only being accelerated by gravity, like the bottle, as it falls, it is accelerating towards the center of the Earth at a rate of 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay? We talk about how heavy something is, how much it weighs, and when we're talking about weight, we're actually talking about the force of gravity. Um, you have a certain amount of mass because you're made up of matter. And your mass is the amount of mass that it is here on the Earth or up in, on the moon or flying in the space station. You would have the same mass, but we would experience different weights. Weight is the force experienced when gravity is accelerating your mass towards the center of the Earth, right? That's what we mean by weight. It's the acceleration of gravity times your mass. So your weight in Newtons would be your mass in kilograms times the acceleration of gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay? So 
if you were to stand on a scale here, it gives you a certain weight. If you were to stand your same body on a scale on the moon, it would be a less weight, a smaller weight, because the moon has less mass. The moon, therefore, attracts you with a weaker gravitational force, which means that you would weigh less, but your mass is the same. And if you ever get a chance to you know, live in a space station, and who knows with the way science is progressing, if that might be something that you do in your lifetime, if Jesus doesn't return, um, you would experience, you'd have the same mass, but you would have no weight, you'd be weightless, because there would be no gravitational force on you strong enough to give you a weight. They could put you on a scale and see what you do. Um, so, Weight is an experience of mass being accelerated by gravity. A couple of people are still writing. We can pause for a minute. Okay, let's do an example problem to calculate weight, the force of gravity, okay? The Golden Jubilee Diamond, currently the world's largest cut diamond with a mass of 545.67 carats. Wow, put that on an engagement ring. Or 109.13 grams. What is the weight of the diamond in Newtons? So what is the, the force of gravity on that object, right? Um, so what we know is the mass, and we know the gravitational acceleration, 9.8 meters per second squared. So we don't know the weight. Weight is mass times the acceleration of gravity. Weight is mass times the acceleration of gravity. So we put in the terms that we know. Weight is, there's the mass, 0 0.10913 kilograms. And the, uh, the acceleration of gravity is a constant, 9.8 meters per second squared. So you multiply that together, and you get 1.06 kilogram meters per second squared, and that is the definition of a newton. So 1.06 newtons. Uh, but we need to correct for significant digits. We were given five significant digits here. Um, and why did we? Oh, because our, our acceleration of gravity was only given to us in two significant digits. It keeps going, actually, but they're giving it to us in two significant digits, 9.8. So 9.8, two significant digits, I have to answer in two significant digits, 1.1 newtons. You guys understand how that works? Yes? Bueno. Take a moment, write that. Okay, so just like any other acceleration question, if we know how quickly something is accelerating, if we know the rate of acceleration, and we know how long that rate of acceleration has been applied to an object, we can figure out how fast it's going, right? So the acceler acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. If I tell you that something has been falling for a certain number of seconds, you can figure out how fast it's going. That ignores wind resistance and uh, some other things that you, know, you don't have to worry about as, as freshmen in high school yet. But you can calculate the velocity given the rate of acceleration in units of time. So velocity is acceleration times time. Any velocity is acceleration times time. So in this particular example, we use G instead of A because we're talking about acceleration of gravity and the unit of time. So how long something has been falling will tell you how fast it's falling. And what's interesting here is that mass doesn't matter. Look at this equation. There's no there's no value for mass. That doesn't come into play. So if Janine and Nico were to jump off of the same cliff at the same time over the water, Janine and Nico would hit the water at the same time, even though Nico is more massive than Janine. And you would ad initially think, well, Nico is more massive. Gravity will attract him stronger, so he'll hit the water first. No, that doesn't matter. Um, as long as neither of them hit terminal velocity, which they wouldn't cliff diving, then they will both be accelerated at the same rate, 9.2 meters or 9, 9.8 meters per second squared. And if they jump off the same instant, they'll hit the water at the same instant. Okay? 
Um, there was a famous experiment done on the moon where an astronaut, stayed, you know, obviously in his spacesuit, he had brought a feather with him and um, he held a feather and a rock and he dropped them and they hit the surface of the moon at the same time. The only reason the feather normally flutters is because it hits terminal velocity very quickly because it's so broad and so light. But with almost no atmosphere on the moon, you drop the two and the rock and the feather hit the ground at the same time. And so just a demonstration of this principle. And it was videotaped one of the things that they did is like, ooh, gee, this is overwhelming. Um, so gravity, the fourth, the acceleration of gravity times time gives you velocity. So let's do an example. Navy SEALs on a halo jump free fall for one whole minute before opening their parachutes. How fast are they going when they do, when they open their parachutes? Now this is ignoring uh, wind resistance. They don't actually get going this fast because of wind resistance. But for freshmen in high school level, let's ignore wind resistance and pretend that they're consistently accelerating at 9.8 meters per second squared. So velocity is 9.8 meters per second squared times 60 seconds. Multiply 9.8 times 60 and you get a very big number with lots of decimals and then we have to round to three sig figs. The velocity there is 588 meters per second. Just out of curiosity, I converted that to miles per hour. That's 1,315 miles per hour. Mach 1.7, almost twice the speed of sound. So if there were no wind resistance, then halo jump, halo skydivers would reach Mach 1.7 before they are before they open their shoes. Hold on, I'm sorry. Amen. I'm doing, oh no, th that's just the battery dying, right? I'm doing a favor for you. So anyway, um, this is, this is uh, not legit because wind resistance slows them way down. But without wind resistance, if they were to go skydiving in a vacuum, they would reach Mach 1.7 before they open their shoes. It's pretty ridiculously fast. Okay. Uh -huh. Oh, oh, what I'm doing. Okay, also, um, because we know how fast things are being accelerated, if we know how long it's falling, we can also tell you how much distance it covered, how far did it fall. So distance is one half the acceleration of gravity times the square of the time interval, or d equals one half g times t squared one half the acceleration of gravity. Now, you can use the same equation later on for any distance. It doesn't have to be free falling. It's just that we're using gravity here as the example. So how far did it fall? Half the acceleration of gravity times the square of the time. D equals one half GT squared, okay? So let's do a problem with that. Back to our seals. Since they fell for one minute, how far did they fall? And again, that's excluding wind resistance, okay? But it's gonna be it's gonna be pretty close. So distance one half g times t squared, one half times nine point eight meters per second squared times sixty seconds. One half times nine point eight meters per second squared times thirty six hundred seconds squared. So you multiply all that together and you get seventeen thousand six hundred and forty meters. Correct for three significant digits. Seventeen thousand six hundred meters it's approximately 11 miles they were very 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 high when they jumped out of that plane and fell for it. okay very 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 high wind resistance rounds that number down a bit but it's still a long jump okay do you guys see how that worked cool beans so the reason that uh, skydivers don't actually make it to Mach 1.7 before they open their chutes um, is because of wind resistance or air drag. I want you to know that it exists. You don't have to do any math with it at this point. The math to calculate wind resistance actually takes calculus. So if you haven't taken calculus, you, you won't need to do that in, in this class. But when you, if you take physics in college, they will likely make you calculate wind resistance. So I just want you to know that it exists. Air drag 
is the force of friction that resists at falling objects. So um, it also resists any kind of object moving in the air. So my hand has air drag. I'm putting more force into my arm than my arm represents with the motion that it achieves because the wind pushes on it. Um, now, I can't move my hand that fast, so the wind resistance is not that big. But in a car, you experience wind resistance more. The faster you go, the more wind resistance um, plays a part. And we talked about friction last week. Friction is always um, increases with the, the uh, air resistance increases in its strength with the speed of the object. So a car parked has zero wind resistance because it's not moving. A car going at five miles an hour has a little bit of wind resistance. A car going at 60 miles an hour has a lot of wind resistance. A car going at 100 miles an hour is even more. The faster you're going, the more the wind resistance matters, which is why uh, in sports cars, it really matters the shape of the car because you want it to slip through the air quickly and, and easily, not have a lot of drag. But wind resistance on buses that are only going to go, you know, 55, 60 miles an hour, it doesn't matter nearly as much. Buses tend to be brick-like. Sports cars aren't brick-like. Um, a brick-like sports car would not win any races. Um, so the faster you go, the more wind resistance, air drag, plays a, plays a role. And so at some point when something is falling, it's accelerating because of gravity. And as it's accelerating, the wind resistance is getting stronger. So the wind resistance slows down its acceleration. There comes a balance point when the force of gravity pulling down on an object is just as strong as the wind resistance pushing up on that object. And that point is called terminal velocity. The object keeps falling. It's not like it stops. But it keeps falling at the same rate of speed. Because from that point on, the acceleration of gravity and the resistance of the wind balance each other. So that's the reason that skydivers don't actually make it to one point to Mach 1.7. Uh, depending on how you hold your body in free fall, um, if you look back at the picture that I had of seals in free fall, they're doing what's called a hard arch, where you you spread your arms and you arch your back and you kick your legs out behind you and you form this like cup shape. The terminal velocity in a hard arch for a human is 120 miles an hour. So when they're in that shape, the fastest they'll fall is 120 miles an hour. Because at 120 miles an hour, the wind resistance pushing up on them is the same strength as the force of gravity pushing down on them. So they'll fall at 120 miles an hour for however long they fall. Okay. Um, you can go into a dive, though, where you tuck your arms by your side, close your legs, and go head first. Um, and then you're presenting a much smaller surface to the wind. Terminal velocity of a falling person going head first in a dive uh, gets up to about 360 miles an hour. So um, that's, the, uh, that's the, the two terminal velocities for people in skydiving. So this, this 1.7 Mach is not real because of wind resistance. Um, so terminal velocity, again, terminal velocity is the speed where you're at a point of equilibrium between the force of friction and the force of gravity. And just to demonstrate um, terminal velocity and wind resistance, I've got two pieces of paper of approximately the same mass. They were both made to be identical with each other. So we're going to call them the same. I'm going to crimple one into a ball so that it has very little surface area and, will, and the wind of it falling will see very, very, very little of the ball, right? So the same amount of mass in a small, small, small amount of space, okay? And now I'm gonna leave this other paper, same amount of mass, broad. So the wind will see all of this and will be able to resist the fall of this piece of paper same mass, I'm going to drop them both at approximately the same instant. And you can see that the paper ball fell a lot faster than the other piece of paper. They have the same mass, they're experiencing the same acceleration because of gravity, 
The only difference is that all the wind resistance on that piece of paper, um, it achieved a terminal velocity almost instantly. It fell just a little bit, and then the wind resistance and gravity balanced, and it achieved terminal, terminal velocity, and it then just kind of fluttered the rest of the way down. Whereas that ball did not yet achieve terminal velocity. They fell at the same rate for the first instant, and then this one stopped accelerating, and the other one kept accelerating. Okay, so I'll show you that one more time. And let's see if there are any questions. So, same mass. Okay, and the only difference is wind, is wind here. Okay, any questions about anything we talked about? Does it, does it all make sense to you? Perfect. Okay, we will play with this idea this week in some labs.